We see them there. Off the coast, the islands. Those islands so near and yet distant. And between the coast and the islands lies the Santa Barbara Channel. We're fortunate to have the Channel Islands offshore. Most coastal areas don't have the islands or the focal point to look at when they look out across the horizon. And man has an innate desire to visit that which he can see on a horizon. Islands have always been an alluring focal point for humans. In the case of the Channel Islands, humans looked back to the mainland. It is on Santa Rosa Island where researchers have found the earliest evidence of humans living in California. The archaeologist Phil Orr, who was curator at our museum, uh, recognized that these were in the same kind of deposit where he'd been finding mammoth bones, bones of the pygmy mammoth that used to exist on that island. And so he realized he had something quite special and, and uh, we call that individual today Arlington Springs man. Our radiocarbon dates show that he lived about 13,000 years ago. Both the living memory of the Chumash and evidence of trade shows that the Chumash developed canoes called tomols and used them to regularly cross the dangerous channel. There were about 20, 25,000 Indians speaking Chumash languages at the time Europeans arrived. And really it's a whole different scale than we have today because there's that many people going to UCSB today. So the, the territory was really lightly settled. That being said, this was the most densely occupied area of all of Aboriginal California. In fact, in the studies that we've done of population density, we find that, that Santa Cruz Island actually had the highest population density anywhere in, in what is now the state of California at the time Europeans arrived. Uh, it's an island, so there's limited places for people to live. But what it also tells us is that the Santa Barbara Channel was incredibly productive, that the marine resources that these people were depending upon supported a much higher population density here than elsewhere. And uh, so two-thirds of the Chumash population lived directly adjacent to the sea, either on the Channel Islands or in these large coastal towns along the coast. And they were harvesting the resources, the fish, uh, shellfish, and uh, seabirds, sea mammals, you know, for their subsistence. We've had 13,000 year, years of coastal inhabitation of peoples in this area, maybe 22,000 years. I mean, there's a debate today. It started with the islands, and then they came to the coast. Uh, we've had droughts and famine and fires in those 13,000 years that changed the behavior of the peoples who lived here. Fifty years after Columbus, Europeans found their way to a place they named California. The first contact that's been recorded with Europeans is the 1542 expedition of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. For more than 200 years, Spain showed little interest in the area other than as a way to facilitate its trade with the Far East. There's actually there's no record of the Spanish being interested in mariculture or exploiting the mariculture that I'm aware of. They were looking at new lands with fresh eyes for the first time, and they weren't settling down and establishing any kind of fishing cultures that I'm aware of historically. Finally, in 1769, Gaspar de Portola, accompanied by Father Junipero Serra, brought Spain's first serious effort to settle what was then called Alta California. The Spanish wished to discourage Russian fur traders from settling further south on the Pacific coast. The mainland mission was to establish the four presidios and to spread the word of Catholicism through the establishment of missions. From Portola's expedition in 1769, California was claimed for the King of Spain. That was when the Native American period officially ended and the Spanish era began. 
So Spain controlled Alta California from 1769 until Mexico revolted against Spain. And the revolt was over and done with. Mexico had gained independence in 1821, but it wasn't until 1822 that word spread to Alta California that they were in fact liberated from Spain. The relatively short Mexican period from 1821 to 1848 was remarkably successful in terms of ranching, with hides actually used as currency during the period. After California gained statehood in 1850, ranching was also introduced to the Channel Islands. A man named James Baron Shaw, who was a physician, the first physician to come to Santa Barbara, began ranching and managing Santa Cruz Island in 1853. So Shaw is the one we know through court testimony who's responsible for placing sheep on Santa Cruz Island. We know that in 1853, a man named James Box brought pigs to Santa Cruz Island. The pigs escaped, became feral, and that was the beginning of the pig population, the wild pig population on Santa Cruz Island. Even in the 19th century, the Santa Barbara Channel's rich natural resources drew it into a global economy. Russian hunters, sea otter hunters came for the rich pelts of the sea otters. Sealing was a huge industry, starting, uh, as far as I know, in the mid-19th uh, century and continued until um, after the turn of the century. And they were hunted for their blubber and oil and whiskers. The Chinese were the first fishermen to exploit the channel for abalone and they dried the meat and sold the shells for export to be made into jewelry and buttons. The Chinese were usurped basically by two things, the Chinese Exclusion Act, so Chinese smuggling became a big business in the channel, but in addition the Japanese invented the diving with the hookah system. So the Japanese came in after the turn of the century and took over the abalone exploitation, the abalone fishing industry. And they continued until eventually Americans got into the business. And as we know today, the black abalone have just been declared an endangered species. So the channel has a rich, long history of being used by different types of fishermen, a lot of ethnic groups, they stuck together and as a community or as communities, ethnic communities, they fished in the channel. For more than the first half of the 20th century, the waters off California continued to be abundant. That was the financial engine that built Southern California. Back in the 30s, uh, uh, real estate speculation was the only other industry in California, uh, and except for fishing and the fishery uh, that uh, in Santa Monica Bay and, and San Pedro Bay was uh, the second biggest in the world. And certainly the diversity was greater than in any other, not only in the ocean, but any other play, any other habitat in the world. When uh, Kaiser Steel, uh, you know, uh, we think of, of uh, them building Liberty ships, but during the war, they put uh, more steel into sardine cans than they did into Liberty ships. We had 50,000 people employed in 1940 just in sardines. Plus, we were packing a lot of bluefin tuna, and I worked on a tuna boat. We're uh, in my misspent youth. Part of that was out in the Santa Monica Bay uh, catching 200-pound bluefin. I can remember when we'd raise schools of fish that uh, you couldn't see, they, they were, as far as you could see in any direction, there was 200 pound fish jumping out of the water. Wow. But overfishing reduced that abundance and public opinion toward maritime fishing and hunting changed. Blue whales, gray whales, sea otters, elephant seals, abalone, and many fish populations had declined or even become nearly extinct. So federal legislation was passed in the 70s that regulated commercial use of maritime resources through the Marine Sanctuary and the Endangered Species Acts. In the early 70s is when a lot of legislation was passed uh, because of the environmental movement, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and also the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was passed at that time uh, around 1972. And the idea was to create uh, to recognize that there's special places in the ocean that are worthy of protection for their 
biological values or their cultural and historical values. Although Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands were earlier designated a national monument, it was in 1980 that Congress established Channel Islands National Park, including the islands of San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, and Santa Barbara, as well as the submerged lands and waters within a mile of each. And so in 1980, when Congress decided to turn the monument into a park, at the same time they also designated the National Marine Sanctuary. The creation of the sanctuary and resulting restrictions has had major impact on commercial fishermen. Basically, the, what I've seen that has, has made it harder for the fishermen is that um, I feel there's still plenty of fish. Um, there's less fishermen now. There's probably not even 15% of the fishermen that were here in the 50s or the 40s or the 60s. Um, so, Basically, it's harder to fish because they've closed the ocean off to fishing. I started going that not over 20 years ago, you know, so more than that, actually. And I've been doing that ever since. It's been tough. I've also had a restaurant. Well, they've taken away from us. They've taken it probably 90% away when Proposition 132 went in effect. Mainly the sport guys taking it away, saying that we did a lot of damage, and, you know, we didn't. They had studies, but they... People voted on it, you know, so we um, we lost it. Once they vote on it, it's hard to change it. But so we had to fish three miles off the beach and a mile off the island, and then we have these new reserves, which takes more away from us. So, and they want to do more. So, it makes it tough. There ain't that many fishermen left, really. Yeah, I kind of got in on the the start of the changes, the start of the conservation of it, and. When I did get in it, there was a problem. We were pillaging and plundering, so to speak, and, but now we've found that we can do it in a sustainable way. And it seems to be working, but a lot of the laws haven't gone back or anything like that. My own take on the fishery is that there's a very good group of uh, fishermen that uh, are always in communication with the state agencies and it is a I think the general opinion at least the way I perceive it that uh, you know it's a battle over the fisheries between the guys that make their living and the people that make the laws um, but regarding a, a battle between big boat small boat um, I think the fishery at this point has kind of gotten down to the, the absolute nadir of operations. Uh, right now our harbor is very active with the squid um, season, which is a real boon for the port and it's a boon for not only the big saners that are kind of transient because they move up and down the coast with, the, with that fishery, um, but the supporting boats, uh, the light boats, and so there's a lot of competition of these, for these relationships and there's a lot of backstabbing and soap opera stuff going on. So I, I work with a few of the light boats that have been here for a long time and they're starting to feel a little, you know, ticked off that the fisheries like that. But it's no different than when the sea urchin industry in the 80s boomed. And, you know, the next thing you knew there was, uh, you know, 100 sea urchin boats and everybody said they were a sea urchin diver. And the old timers, um, you know, were uh, kind of you know, put out of business because there were just too many people um, fishing for one thing. When I was building boats, I actually built a couple of boats that were urgent boats back in the heyday, and I, you know, I saw the, the money that was to be made there, you know. Kids showing up making, you know, a couple thousand bucks a day, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, wow, I, I'm making 400 bucks a a week building your boat, you know, I maybe had to check out that uh, urchin dive. And, uh, you know, right right when I got into it, it kind of fizzled out. <laughs> but now the uh, the cucumbers are, are a, a better diving. Uh, I mean, $3 a pound is, I remember when it started at 25 cents a pound, you know. Fishermen don't want to see the resource go away because if it goes away, they, they have no income. They want to take care of it the best they can. 
And if it makes good sense, they'll support us. But when you start looking at all the sanctuaries on the coast, there's a lot, a lot of area that's being closed to protect stuff that's really unnecessary. As far as if you know about the ocean and you know how fish move and you know things, it's in, in your opinion, they don't need to do this. It's not doing any good for fishing. The thing that's screwing up fishing is pollution. And they're not doing anything about pollution. How can they control uh, Santa Monica when it rains three inches and everything runs into the bay? And you go take a water sample and not safe to swim. How do you control that? It's, it's almost impossible. Um, fishermen see pollution coming from way before anybody else. They see certain fish don't like polluted water. Certain fish don't like... Um, some stuff that comes out of the oil platform sometimes. Um, what it does to them, I don't know. It burns their eyes, it burns their gills, they just... Albacore used to come to Catalina, Albacore used to come to Point Doom, they used to come to Rocky Point. They're never going to come there again. They come in and they sense something and they turn around and they go back where they're happy. That's pollution. And, and so... Can a sanctuary stop pollution? Really hard, you know, to stop pollution. You have to stop pollution on land. You can stop pollution in the water from people discharging things, you know. You don't see fishermen doing that. They, they want the water to be good. You don't see them pumping diesel into the water or dumping their oil out of their engine into the water. They, they don't do that because they respect the, the ocean. But other people do that. It's contributed to everyone. If you drive a bicycle and it has a chain on it, and that chain has oil on it, it drips onto the asphalt, and it rains, it ends up in the ocean. Bottom line. Some say that sport fishing has also had impacts. Any f recreational fisherman who tells me recreational fishers do not have impacts on marine ecosystems hasn't been fishing very long. Um, Look at the, the daily charter boat uh, fish catches in the newspaper and you see sand dabs and things like that now listed as fish that are caught on these charter boat operators and that's ridiculous. 30 years ago, people weren't catching sand dabs and broadcasting it uh, as, a, as a, uh, a reason to get on board. You know? uh, so people who don't understand the relationship between the commercial recreational fishing industry, which is commercial, you know, 120 people fishing, the same spot with fish finders, with multiple lines in the water, and you know, six hooks to a line, and all that food that's brought up, uh, you know, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, um, that's a commercial enterprise. And the level of fish and biomass taken from the ocean was it was dramatic, and I was a party to it. Yes, we need a a, a, a living port. We need a living marina in Santa Barbara. We need to see recreational. Uh, but more importantly, commercial activities going on in the harbor. You know, I want to see those boats out there that are in the harbor. I don't want it to become Newport Beach. You know, I don't want it to become Dana Point. I, I want commercial fishers to be fishing. But in some cases, the use of our local marine system for global markets doesn't seem to fit, doesn't seem to benefit me in this region. It benefits a few at the cost of the many. And uh, there's about 140 people who fish from the marine sanctuary, for example. 11 of them make 85% of the money. In the 21st century, commercial use of the channel is increasingly weighted towards tourism and recreational use. Years ago, nobody'd be out there unless they were a commercial fisherman, you know. And, uh, you know, the rarity of a sailboater, you know, for the day or whatever. But uh, now it's becoming, you know, more and more used. Surfers share the channel, but sometimes it gets crowded at the best spots. Ventura has always produced good surfers. Um, you know, when Rencon is good or, you know, some of the other waves, uh, you know, people will come from a lot of places to ride it. Uh, you know, as surfing expanded, it, it, you know, really it started taking off in the early 60s. Uh, you know, most people just rode their local breaks, and you know, God knows if there were 30 guys out at Rencon, you'd think it was a crowd. But uh, 
you know, when it's any good, uh, God knows there'll be 200 guys out now. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a way different world, a way more mobile world. When you're in the community, you feel like it's being shared very nicely with you. And when you're not in the community, uh, different communities, different beaches have a reputation for either being more territorial or being more open to outsiders coming in. Um, as a woman, I think that, believe it or not, I, it's an advantageous for me because I, it, it's a novelty. Being a kayaker, it's a real disadvantage because surfers don't like kayakers, and it's for a good reason. It's much harder to control a kayak. They're bigger boards, they're dangerous when they're caught in the white water and they're just being barreled ahead. So I try very hard when I'm out in the water to keep at least 40 feet minimum from other surfers. And um, so I will often be relegated to a less desirable breaking place. But I can also catch the waves a lot faster than they can, so I tend to ride more waves than they do. Fishing and recreational boats, along with dolphins and whales, must coexist with freighters in the channel. People don't realize that there are 6,000 container ships and marine vessels that use this channel every year. When you go to the islands, a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of freighters. I guess that has to be. But, you know, one of the things I dislike intensely is they pump their bell juice as they go through the channel. And you will go through oil slicks that are miles long. And, you know, it just reeks of diesel. And, you know, you know that it's no good for anything out there. Uh, if there were a way to control that, I'd be real happy about that. Uh, you know, that so many of the items that are being brought into me, uh, you know, and this is a personal statement, you know, are just useless, you know. Uh, the trade-off there, I don't like. But again, you know, the, the sea has always been for commerce. And, you know, some of the greatest people, I mean, a guy who pops to mind is Joseph Conrad. Well, you know, what did he do? You know, Conrad was a, a sailor. And, you know, he delivered goods. That's what he did, so... Chumash legend tells the story of the earth goddess, Hutash, who decided that some of the Chumash would have to move off the island and go to the mainland. She created a rainbow bridge across the channel. The Chumash began to cross, but some became dizzy and fell off. Hutash didn't want them to drown, so she turned them into dolphins. And from that day, the Chumash claim the dolphins are their brothers. Whale watching boats offer the thrilling opportunity to see whales and dolphins in their environment. I've been out uh, sailboating the, the channel and was able to come up quite close to a small pod of blue whales, and that was really exciting. I've also seen orcas further, a little further to the south, but still in, in the channel. And um, there was one time that, you know, much further out uh, on an island packer's boat to the island, there was just this the most humongous pot of dolphins that just went on. And, I mean, thousands of dolphins. It was just, and the, the you know, the, the men on the boat, the crew on the boat said that it was the largest pod they had ever seen. It was just phenomenal. Island Packers, a concessionaire to the National Park, gives tens of thousands of people the chance each year to enjoy the channel. The boys and their father had gone out camping. They loved to camp together. And uh, after the camping trip, they came back in and they'd always wanted a backpacking station in the High Sierras. And um, they said, you know, this would be a good place to have a backpacking station to the islands. And that's how the name Island Packers came about. So I says, well, you know, he was an engineer at that time for Bomar TIC, um, designing engineer. And uh, so the kids seemed to like it and everything. So we went ahead and bought an old fishing boat and revamped it. And this is how we got started. We take 70,000 people out to the Channel Islands now. And um, a lot of those are whale watching boats as well as landing ashore on the island, a variety, but um, it definitely has improved Ventura Harbor as well as all these successful restaurants and shops in the Harbor Village. 
the experience of being on the islands can be transforming. Once you've stepped on one of the California Channel Islands, you never look at them through the same eyes again. California Galapagos, and that's mm -hmm. what the comments are a lot. It's just like the Galapagos, and uh, just protected and primitive. We flew due west, and we, we um, buzzed the camp at Scorpion on the east end of the island and landed on the airstrip, and I fell in love with that second with the beautiful terrain. It was so quiet. I had never been anywhere that quiet. It was quieter than at sea. It was so quiet and so immense and so unlike anything that I had ever seen or experienced. And uh, I was going to stay no matter what. Now coming full circle, many tribe members take island packers boats to the islands to celebrate the annual crossing by Chumash Oarsman in a traditionally built and that's a big, big event, and all the Chumash tribes and stuff book on the boat and go out to the island and stay and greet the, the Tomol with the group of Chumash paddlers at Santa Cruz Island for Santa Capa and then Santa Cruz, and then they have a big powwow on the island. So, you know, I think that's just really, really neat that they do that every year. We are in an incredibly fortunate position to be able to have this channel that is shared by so many different interests from fishermen to kayakers to swimmers to people who want to cross the channel to experience the beauties of the California Channel Islands. Very few places on earth offer what we have here and I think with education and an appreciation of what this channel and what the islands has to offer by treading lightly, by understanding the interests of all groups and not just one's own, that the channel can be shared by a number of people very successfully, and I think that's happening now.